Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be here again, perhaps I should say, after the previous one two years ago. The theme that we are asked to speak on is um, a celebration of reason. And I do want to really stay with that theme and be positive in what I'm saying today. I'm sure that over uh, today and tomorrow, there's going to be plenty of religion bashing, um, plenty of criticism of uh, superstition and faith and belief that lacks reason, and that's as it should be. Uh, that's an important role for free-thinking thought, for atheists to point out the deficiencies in attitudes to life that do not give attention to reason. But I want to... Um, focus on the positive in what I'm saying in the time here and uh, to emphasize what reason has achieved, the important things that we have really because of our ability to reason and the progress that we've made because of it. About 30 years ago, I wrote a book called The Expanding Circle. Um, it's recently been reissued. It's nice when things you wrote 30 years ago still seem relevant enough to some publisher for them to decide to, to put it out again. So it was reissued. They, they changed the subtitle slightly. It had been subtitled Ethics and Sociobiology, but sociobiology is not a term that's very much even used now. So the new subtitle is Ethics, Evolution, and Moral Progress. And it's particularly the ethics and moral progress aspect of it that I want to talk about. But um, the book began, and really the theme of the book in a way, you could say that if I was preaching a sermon today, this would be my text. Um, uh, the theme was a quote from W.E.H. Lecky. I don't know how many of you have heard of Lecky, but I think it's appropriate that his name be mentioned at an event like this. Lecky was a 19th century historian of ideas. He wrote a two-volume work called A History of the Rise of Rationalism in Europe, um, still very much worth reading, published in 1865. Um, and he wrote a somewhat better-known work called A History of European Morals from Augustus to Charlemagne. In other words, from the period of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity. And although you might think that from a conventional point of view, a history of European morals from the Roman Empire to the rise of Christianity would be positive about the rise of civilizing Christianity and the decline of paganism and so on, uh, Lecky is not at all like that. Um, Lecky can see a lot of good in, uh, the more in the Roman ethics that actually got lost in the rise of Christianity. Um, but the theme, the text, as I was saying, is actually a quote uh, from Lecky, which I'll now read you. The moral unity to be expected in different ages is not a unity of standard or of acts, but a unity of tendency. At one time, the benevolent affections embrace merely the family, Soon the circle expanding, you can see where I got the title of the book, soon the circle expanding includes first a class, then a nation, then a coalition of nations, then all humanity, and finally, this remember was in the mid 19th century, and finally its influence is felt in the relations of humans with animals. I think if Leckie had been around today, he would have been able to say that that vision of his was vindicated, is being vindicated. Of course, we haven't fully extended morality even to all humanity properly, let alone to our dealings with the animal world, but I would say we're getting there. And indeed, the, the, the theme that we're getting there is, is the theme of what I want to talk about. And in doing so, I want to draw on a, another remarkable book, much more recent one, that I think can stand with um, W.E.H. Lecky and in some way continues the thought of my own little work, The Expanding Circle, um, with, with attribution, of course. Um, 
Uh, and that's by Steven Pinker. Um, and Steven Pinker, some of you may have known from his book, The Language Instinct in particular, or The Blank Slate. Uh, he's a professor of psychology at Harvard. His most recent book is called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Now, you might say, what am I doing here at an atheist convention praising a book that has angels in the title? Well, it's a quote from Abraham Lincoln who talks about, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's very American that, um, you know, even people who are not particularly religious will use quotes like better angels or inner demons. It's, the book, in a way, is a contrast between the inner demons of our nature and the better angels. But I think we can safely take that as metaphor. So, um, in the better angels of our nature, Pinker addresses some really big questions, like, are human beings essentially good or bad? Have we witnessed moral progress throughout recent history or moral collapse? Do we have grounds for being optimistic about the future? And there's a lot more specific questions too which are really interesting. For example, what do we owe to the Enlightenment? Is there a link between the human rights movement and the animal rights movement? Why are homicide rates higher in the southern states of the United States, the Bible Belt, than they are in the northern states? How does a president's IQ correlate with the number of battle deaths in wars in which the US is involved? There's an interesting little statistic for you. And the answer is, I'll give you that one now if you like, the higher the president's IQ, the lower the number of U US battle deaths in, in wars in, in which the US is involved. And finally, are we getting smarter? And is a smarter world a better world? So Pinker draws on a, his ba own background in psychology, in, but also on history, in anthropology, economics, sociology, cognitive science, and also uh, gets into philosophical waters. And the very positive conclusion that he reaches is that our era is less violent, less cruel, more peaceful than any previous period of human existence, and, and this is the important point for what we're talking about today, and that human reason is a principal factor in this decline in violence. To summarize, to put the decline in violence in, in one simple sentence, we could understand it this way. People living in the world today are less likely to meet a violent death or to suffer from violence or cruelty at the hands of their fellow humans than people living in any previous century. Now, you may be skeptical of that claim if you just look at the, scan the media headlines over the last few years, you might think, well, can that really be true? There seems to be violence going on somewhere in the world all the time. But indeed, the claim can be documented. If you begin with studies of skeletons found at archaeological sites, averaging their results suggests that about 15% of prehistoric humans met a violent death at the hands of another person. 15%, almost one in seven. How many of you know somebody in all your acquaintances who's met a violent death at the hands of another human? Maybe some of you will be unfortunate enough to know one but certainly not a seventh of your acquaintances. And it's not just looking at skeletons from archaeological research. If you look at evidence that we have of contemporary or recent hunter-gatherer societies, that shows a fairly similar sort of average rate of violent death. Whereas, if you look at state societies, so the first important factor in the decline of violent death is the development of the state. And although we know that states can be violent themselves and bloody, the most violent state in terms of killing its own people appears to have been the Aztec nation of Mexico 
And in Aztec, Mexico, about 5% of people were killed by others, it seems. One in 20. Whereas in Europe, even during the bloodiest periods of Europe, European history, such as the 17th century, the Thirty Years' War, or the 20th century, which we know saw two terrible wars, deaths were only around 3% of the population. So the data indicates that Thomas Hobbes was really right in the 17th century when he said that without the state, life is likely to be nasty, brutish, and short. But apart from violence by war and by tribes fighting each other, even within tribes, there is less violence. Murder itself is declining. We sometimes have these rather mythical pictures of peaceful nomadic tribes, and we contrast that with our own big cities. But actually that idea is wrong. Even if you look at the tribes that have been most praised for their Pacific nature, such as the Kung of the Kalahari, or the Inuit of the Central Arctic, or the Semai of Malaysia, turns out that their murder rates are roughly comparable to those of Detroit, a city in the United States with one of the highest murder rates, when, of course, we're talking about as a percentage of, of population. And so there has been a civilizing process in the states as we have developed. And uh, in fact, to answer that question, why is the murder rate higher in the southern states of the United States than in the north, it would be nice to say, well, it's because there are more Christians in the south, but um, we can't actually say that. But what we can say is that the south is more of a traditional society in avenging wrongs by taking justice into your own hands. There is good evidence that people are more likely to take retribution into their own hands in the South than they are in the North, and indeed that there's a culture in which people are more sensitive to insults. They don't just brush them off. And you can test this in nice little psychological studies in universities where you have students from both the South and the North, and you set up experiments where um, they think they're going to do something like answer a questionnaire, but actually somebody bumps into them in the corridor and then says, get out of my way, you asshole. Um, and the southerners react much more strongly to that than the northerners. Um, and uh, so there is a difference in that culture. And it's that kind of traditional honor culture. And part of what I'm saying is that when we are thinking, when we are reasoning, we get a little bit beyond that. But let's come to the Enlightenment the age of reason, as it's often called, in 17th and 18th century Europe, where a really important change occurred in this process. The development of the state was one change, but the civilizing impact of the Enlightenment was another. Why did the Enlightenment occur around that time? Well, one important factor that precedes it is the invention of the printing press and the idea that you now have a European community of ideas in a way that was much more difficult before. Not that you didn't have it, but it can spread much more easily because of the cheap communication of ideas. And revolution, as important as what we're starting to see, what we're seeing now with the, the internet, another further stage uh, of this communication of ideas. But it was during the Enlightenment that voices began to be raised against things that had previously been taken for granted in this traditional society that did not reason and did not criticize so much. Slavery is one obvious example. Torture, the use of torture as a routine state instrument. Despotism, the overthrow of the ancien regime in France and elsewhere. The decline of dueling, dueling uh, again, as a, a way of settling insults and uh, to one's honor, and uh, reform of extreme forms of punishment, of things uh, uh, like the use of the rack and, and various other kinds of flogging and so on. And even in the 18th century, we do see in Europe, really for the first time since uh, the coming of Christianity, the rise of voices calling for gentler, 
and kinder treatment of animals, which is part of that civilizing process. So that was an important trend. Now it's true that despite that, we had the horrors of the 20th century culminating in the Holocaust. And so we can't see this as just a steady rise. It's more like you would see it as, I guess, the stock markets dips and falls, but still generally tending upwards. Um, so you, yes, you can get aberrations, you can get throwbacks to a kind of non-rational barbarism, which is, is I think, a, a way of looking at the Nazi appeal to racism, to ethnic solidarity and, and racial hatred, and so on. So you can get that. But fortunately, despite the very gloomy view that you might have of human beings um, if you grew up just after the end of the Second World War, um, as I did and as I know a lot of people, older people who'd been that had, the most remarkable thing is that since 1945, more than 66 years now, we have not had a major war between major powers in the world. And we've not really had a major war between developed nations at all, putting aside, say, very brief interludes like the NATO attack on, on Serbia, perhaps. Um, but um, we've really had a long period that has been largely peaceful. And uh, during this period, and in particular since the end of the Cold War, around 1989, um, we've actually had a decline in wars of all kinds, even including the wars uh, among developing nations, smaller wars, including also civil war, including horrific events like the Holocaust or like the killing fields of um, Cambodia or uh, uh, the massacres in Rwanda. We've actually had a decline as compared with other times in history uh, of those kinds of killing. Um, again, the statistics back it up, and we're talking, of course, proportionate to population. And finally, we've had, in recent years, uh, a revolution in understanding of rights of uh, minorities in particular, or women, not a minority at all, but of ethnic minorities, rights of children, the rights of homosexuals, um, and even, of course, the rights of animals. So we've had a broadening of understanding of this and a real change in culture in what is acceptable nowadays. I'll give you just uh, two examples, come out again out of Pinker's book. He has an illustration from the 1950s for uh, a brand of coffee and the advertisement shows a husband with his, or a man let's say, with a woman over his lap like this and he's spanking her. Why is he spanking her? Because she brought the wrong brand of coffee. I don't think you could really sell coffee today by showing domestic violence. <laughs> That's a good thing, surely. And the other example Pinker gives from his own experience when he was a young uh, graduate student working in psychology. Under the direction of his professor, he says, he tortured a rat to death. He regards this now as perhaps the worst thing he has ever done. But it was quite routine for researchers in psychology in the 1960s, certainly when I started researching animal liberation in the early 70s, it was very easy to find the most appalling things being done to animals in the name of research and being quite openly published in journals and being quite routine in what was happening. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't still appalling things being done to animals, but I think they are fewer. I think there has been a, something of a civilizing process in that area too. May still have a long way to go, but certainly doing these things as openly and thoughtlessly as they were done then is no longer possible. Well, what caused these beneficial trends? That's an interesting question, and there isn't any really simple answer. I've talked already about the state monopoly on force, which seems to have been a good thing, the invention of the printing press and the spreading of ideas, also the spreading of commerce, 
which makes it possible for people to cooperatively work together to prosper across national boundaries as well, and therefore to have more at stake if they violently attack others. But um, one of the things that leads to, one of the better angels of our nature that leads to this civilizing process, I think, and, and Pinker thinks as well, is indeed reason, our better capacity to reason. In the expanding circle, I talked, I used the metaphor of an escalator of reason. I described reason as something that you start doing, and you may start reasoning purely for self-interested purposes. That is, you want to reason in order to find out how to advance your own interests or those of your family or your immediate group. But reason is not something that we completely control in that way. We can be led by reasoning processes to places and conclusions that we did not really expect. And that's why it's like an escalator. You know, you get on an escalator at the lower floor and it just takes you up and you don't quite know where it's going to take you if you haven't been there before, what you're going to find at the top of the escalator, but you're on it. You can run back down the escalator, but it's hard work. Um, generally, you'll keep going. And um, Pinker uh, uses uh, that idea as part of what he says, in which we talk about this expanding circle where we start to see that others are really like us. We get to know more about them. Now, certainly there's an emotional component here too. I'm not saying this is a pure matter of reason because empathy is really critical here. You can have people, psychopaths, who in one sense can reason but lack empathy and then do horrible things to other people. But if we have, and fortunately humans have evolved, most of us anyway, to have a certain level of empathy for others, if we have that, and we combine that with the capacity to reason, to see that others are not so different from us really, and to overcome that innate sense of suspicion of those who are different. And that is, I think, something that is innate. It can be demonstrated even in, in babies of three months old that they're more likely to smile at the face of somebody who is from the, has the general appearance of, of the people who they're used to seeing that is, in other words, someone of the same race as their family. They're more likely to smile at that kind of face than the face of somebody from a completely different race. So I think there's something like that that is actually, unfortunately, perhaps innate in us, but our reasoning capacities can broaden our empathy to overcome that and to see that that kind of racism is wrong. And that's an important part of this civilizing process. But there's something else that I want to mention that is, is really interesting and it's perhaps not very well known, and that's the Flynn effect. Actually, let me just ask you, how many of you have heard of the Flynn effect? Not very many, which is interesting because it's a really important discovery and it's a discovery made by James Flynn, who is uh, an emeritus professor of political science at the University of Otago in Dunedin. So those of you who are also Australians, we're talking about someone in the same part of the world that we're in, who's really not as celebrated, I think, as he should be. So Flynn discovered, more or less accidentally, that the average IQ has been rising over the past century or so, over the period of which we've taken IQ test scores. You might say, what do you mean the average IQ has been rising? Isn't the average IQ always 100? Yes, the average IQ is always 100, but that's intentional, that's something we manufacture in order to achieve that level. And to manufacture it, we have to recalibrate the results that we get on IQ tests to produce an average of 100. And if you actually looked at the questions, I think Flynn's example, it took, he took some IQ tests from 1912, so just a century ago now, and you look at the answers that somebody of average IQ today, with an IQ of 100 today, would score on that test, they would be given an IQ of 130 in 1912. They would have been given that IQ. That's right towards the top. I think it's the 
the top 5% or something like that of IQ scores then. Well, what's going on? I mean, how could we really be becoming smarter in such a short period of time? You can't get genetic selection that would produce that in a century. But what is going on, I think, or Flynn and, and Pinker and others who studied this think, is that we live in a different world. We live in a world in which we're much more used to using symbols and abstract ideas. And that this is a large part of, of what's actually happening here. It's not just better education. You might think we've got better schools, and that's what's going on. But actually, people do better in those parts of the test that you can't really educate for. The more abstract questions, um, you know, the you know, IQ tests, the kinds of shapes and things like that, what is here. It's, it's things that where education doesn't make a big difference that we see this rise. So um, we live in a more symbol-rich environment and scientific reasoning has spread and that makes a significant difference, I believe, to the way we think about the world and it makes a difference morally too that um, uh, we think better about the world, we think in a way that enables us to take account of more abstract ideas, like the idea that uh, in some sense humans all have equal moral status or we ought to respect human rights or that we ought to consider the interests of animals as well. And we think through some of those traps of, say, defending our honour which so often leads to violence, leads to people refusing to back down. And for that reason, we're better able to avoid war. Uh, Pinky uses the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Imagine if Kennedy and Khrushchev had just stood on their honour and said, no, I'm right, I'm not going to back down. We may not be here today to talk about it. But they could see that this was a kind of a trap that they needed to get out of, that two s nuclear superpowers were on a collision course. And they could see that it was more important to think about the consequences than to think about their honour or losing face or something of that sort. So this is what's really important and this is what we should celebrate. That reason leads us to consider all the consequences of our action and not simply to be in thrall to our emotions, to our evolved nature, or for that matter, to some of the superstitious beliefs that may have been handed down to us by cultural traditions. Now, there's no guarantee, of course, that we won't have disastrous world wars again between superpowers. All we're talking about is a tendency, a shift in probabilities that reason has caused. But we do have a lot of problems and we need to be able to th reason our way through them. One of the big problems obviously that we face is climate change. And there was a study that came out too recently for Pinker to take account of it that suggested that when there are abnormal climate patterns, for example, series of droughts, a uh, study based in, in parts of the world like Africa where there'd been recurrent droughts, you get more cross-border conflict than when there is normal weather, stable weather patterns. We're now messing with the climate of our planet in ways that could cause huge climate instability. And that's clearly a threat to peace and progress. And unfortunately, we have climate skeptics in the world who are not looking at what the science says, who are not respectful of the overwhelming majority of scientists in the area, some of whom just have different ideas about what's going on, don't understand the science properly, but certainly some of them are actually using religion as the basis. I've certainly heard people argue, God would not allow us to destroy our planet. So it can't be true that the human release of greenhouse gases is going to dramatically change the climate of the planet, causing hundreds of millions or billions of people to become climate refugees. We know that God wouldn't allow that, don't we? Well, that's the kind of attitude 
that we have to fight. We have to look at the science, look at the consequences, and follow that. And if we can do that, then I'm hopeful that we will continue to celebrate reason, and that over the coming centuries, times that I won't live to see, times that some of you younger people in the audience may, we will reach even greater achievements in establishing peace and establishing basic human rights and uh, including animals within the expanding circle of moral concern. And we'll look back uh, on the past and think, how could people ever have been so stupid and so superstitious that they did the things that they did as recently as the 20th century. Thank you.